All right. So our learning targets for today are these. Uh, first of all, to understand the characteristics of high quality implementation. Secondly, to understand what must be done to prepare for implementation and monitoring. Thirdly, to understand the considerations for monitoring and adjusting. And finally, to understand uh, possible tools that might be used for implementation and monitoring. And as I said, the tools should be listed, should be uh, linked, and should be accessible to you in the power in the uh, screenshot of just the of just the actual slides. So, before we even get started with implementation, there are a few questions that we really should consider. So, first of all, in addition to all the actions that are written in the plan itself, <clears throat> do we have the necessary systems in place? to support implementation of all of those actions. Secondly, is the whole team on board with the improvement goals and targets? Do they understand what they are? Do they understand what they mean? And then finally, is there a clear understanding of the general characteristics of high quality implementation? And if not, what must be done to gain that understanding by the relevant stakeholders? So again, if the answers to any of these questions is no, the implementation team really needs to consider whether something must be done to ensure that the plan can move forward as written. So these general characteristics of high quality implementation are gonna serve as kind of our, our, uh, of our uh, roadway to today to uh, go through this, this PowerPoint. So we'll be addressing each one of them. So first of all, you can see the first one are the multiple cycles of assess and reassess needs, implement, monitor, and adjust, and then eventually evaluation as well. The next series of slides uh, is gonna provide information on each of these, as well as have tools that are associated with them. And you'll often find that the tools can be used in multiple ways, uh, both as a planning tool, as well as uh, in many cases, uh, a monitoring tool. So this is probably a graphic that looks familiar to most of you. On the left side, we see the MICIP cycle. It's characterized by the five components, or sometimes we refer to them as sub-processes um, because they are processes in themselves. And, you, and they're focused on the whole school, the whole community and whole child, sometimes just shortened to whole child. Although again, the community and the school are certainly integral elements of that, as well as then contextualized within the, uh, con uh, the district vision, the mission and beliefs. Um, but in actuality, implementation is not just the one cycle. Implementation is really represented by the graphic on the right side, where we have that series of repeated cycles where data from the monitor and adjust processes from one implementation cycle then informed the next cycle and so on. So in addition to having an understanding of the MICIP process and cycle, it's really important that uh, we have an understanding of the stages of implementation as well. So NERN developed the implementation stages planning tool to describe the various actions and behaviors that should take place at each stage. And along with a tool on the next slide, which we'll get to in a minute, the planning tool really helps identify the activities that a district may need to consider as part of its plan. So it's important to note that while there is a bit of a sequence to the stages, it's also likely that users may move back and forth between the various stages. And especially if the plan is being implemented by multiple buildings, depending on their readiness for implementation, it, uh, those different schools could be in different stages of implementation at the same time. So on the left side, you see a description of what happens at each stage. And then these stages not only inform what happens during implementation, but then they also inform what happens during monitoring. So just take a moment to notice if you're not familiar with those stages, um, what happens at each of the stages from exploration, which is really 
which really happens during the planning process um, to make sure that it fits uh, the innovation, the strategy really fits the district's needs and whether implementation is feasible. And you might recognize words there that are familiar to the hexagon tool, if uh, you're familiar with that, to installation, which really means kind of getting ready to actively engage in the uh, implementation, making sure that the resources are in place, making sure that uh, whatever professional learning has to take place um, is in place as well. Then into the initial implementation, which means one of two things. It can mean just starting to put the strategy in place and some of those early uh, adoptions components, as well as putting it in place on a limited scale. So especially the larger districts may decide that they don't want to put something in place with all of their schools right away, but that uh, they're going to do it on a limited scale and then scale it up later on. It could be uh, individual grade levels, um, and other segments of an actual district. And then finally, to put into uh, full implementation. Um, so implementation could mean uh, just more skillfully pull it into place, or it could mean um, scaling it up from that limited scale to full scale. It also, uh, the initial implementation also uh, includes a possible uh, identifying barriers for implementation and looking for ways to identify solutions for those before you go into full implementation. So again, um, it's pretty important that before a school start implementing that they understand what that concept, the stages of implementation mean, because uh, that's um, part of the uh, characteristics of high quality implementation as well. So as I, I just referenced this particular tool, and some of you may have uh, used this before. So depending on how we're going to implement a plan, uh, we need to identify the activities that are going to allow us to implement the strategy with fidelity. And so on this chart, you see um, some, you see the stages across the top from installation. And uh, we don't have exploration there because that's usually takes place in the building of the plan. But then installation, um, once we start implementing it is to um, basically get ready for the, for the levels of implementation. And you'll notice some of the activities that could possibly be included in installation. Um, on implementation, again, that includes both the initial as well as full implementation, some possible activities. And you notice, again, the driving questions that uh, are underneath each of those headings as well. What we've also done is to um, pull out both the monitor and just components as well as the evaluate components because it's critical that we think about those well before we're going to monitor and well before we're going to um, evaluate that those be in place right from the get-go. So um, again, all of those are just possible activities depending on the status of, uh, of the plan and the strategy that's, uh, that a district is choosing to implement. So what those do then is those align with those stages. And later on, uh, when we're doing the monitoring, um, a tool like this can be really helpful as well, because one of the things we're going to monitor is whether or not the activities that we've identified have actually been put in place, if have, have we've actually, uh, actually done those. So then as uh, we think about the actual monitoring process, um, a few quotes come to mind, and you see them on the right side of your screen here. Uh, you, you see the definition of um, implementation, uh, excuse me, of monitoring, and um, to systematically review the progress of implementation and the impact of actions, and, and the three quotes. So first of all, the minute you start implementing, you start monitoring, um, which is uh, probably one of the more basic quotes re relative to implementation and monitoring. Because uh, we are human beings, what gets monitored gets done. And so if something is not being monitored, it decreases the chances that will actually happen. And then uh, our, the statement about plan for your monitoring, as we've been talking about with that uh, chart, 
uh, but then also monitor what you plan. And so those three kind of characterize uh, the importance and the relationship between implementation and monitoring. So there are also some considerations in terms of monitoring, some, some important things to think about. So we already talked about the first bullet that monitoring must be considered in every part of the continuous improvement process. We specifically talked about monitoring, excuse me, about planning. But when we look at the uh, components, the rest of the components of MICIP, it's really important to consider them there as well. So even during the assess needs process, the data that is chosen for the data story later is used for monitoring. And so when we look at that data, um, that's an important consideration right from uh, building the data story. Um, we've already kind of talked about the um, planning process that monitoring data is going to help us know when to move between the stages of implementation, as well as to move um, in, ter in terms of how much of the district. Should it be the entire district? Is it a school by school thing? Um, so uh, information monitoring data is critical for that. Um, monitoring also um, either confirms or contradicts our theory of change or our logic model that gets reflected in the challenge statement. So, you know, we recommend the challenge statements uh, be done in three parts. So if, then, so that, and the so that is almost always the impact on students. Um, so when we looked at our data and we did our root cause analysis, we made our best uh, guess in terms of what it was going to take to change the data from our existing data to where we wanted it to be. And so we wrote the challenge statement um, and now monitoring lets us know, did we make the right prediction? Did we choose the right thing? So it's important to have the right monitoring data that aligns with that uh, theory of change or with our challenge statement and ultimately then with the goal that comes that comes from that. Uh, the next um, statement there talks about uh, the adjustment to the plan and we'll get that at the toward the end of our conversation today. but um, we don't want to jump into adjusting the plan too quickly. It's really easy if we don't initially meet our, targets, our first interim targets that we just say, well, then let's change them. And usually people that people then lower them. Um, that's one way to meet them, but that's probably not the best way. And there are other impacts, other adjustments that we can make as well. So we want to make sure that we give our plan enough time to get legs under it and to make sure that we are implementing it with the level of fidelity that it calls for. But at the same time, we don't want to waste time and not make the adjustments if uh, the plan really calls for it. And so monitoring data is critical for that. Monitoring also uh, is really a, a significant and probably the most important part of what we have typically called program evaluation. So it's collecting that data that lets us know, similar to what we just talked about, whether um, our strategies are working the way that we want them to. And so it's even though it's called evaluation, it's really the monitoring data that's the more significant part of that. And the evaluation component, at least as defined in my KIP, is uh, just the, the summative part of the formative monitoring process. Um, in addition to monitoring looking different depending on the stage of implementation, which means that it could look different between buildings, um, it also is going to look different depending on the kind of goal that you have. So, for example, if you have primarily an academic goal um, with uh, academic and achievement targets, um, that monitoring is going to look one way. Whereas if you have a non-academic goal or a systems goal, you're going to be looking at other things. So, again, um, that the kind of goal that you have affects the kind of monitoring that you're going to do. Um, we talked about the importance of having systems in place before you really jump into implementation. And so it's really important that uh, districts and schools monitor the ongoing effectiveness of their systems, not just whether they have them in place, but whether they continue to be effective or not. And then finally, it's really important to uh, monitor not only the individual goals and activities, 
that are part of the plan, but really to monitor the entire continuous improvement process. And so we'll talk real briefly about that uh, closer as we get to the end. So again, just some considerations for uh, monitoring, just like we had some considerations around implementation. So for each of these components, you're going to see that we have some, again, preparations, uh, some considerations for preparation. So these are just some general considerations in terms of the entire monitoring process. So first of all, um, just like with implementation, people needing to know their roles in, in implementation. Similarly, in monitoring, does everyone who's involved in the monitoring process know what their role is, as well as the tools and timelines that uh, are going to be used for that monitoring? And is that common understanding across the district? And then another piece that we call out here, and we will again a little bit later, is that whole idea of perception data. So. Rightfully so, we need to collect all the other kinds of data that we have, that satellite data that are typically our state test scores, um, the larger grain size um, types of things, um, the map data, which might be in terms of, say, achievement data, that might be your classroom data, your individual student data. But it's really important that we collect that perception data by those who are being impacted by the plan that we have uh, in place. So uh, we wanna make sure that all voices are heard. And certainly one way to do that is through uh, a survey, but the better way to do that really is to actually having conversation with uh, those voices. So a big question is, as part of our monitoring process, do we have a way to collect that kind of, uh, that kind of data as well? So when we're talking about monitoring, we're talking about four components, and you can see those highlighted in the center here. So three of them are related to implementation, which is the which um, are the three that are highlighted in the in the boxes, and then all of them uh, determined uh, impact. If any of these is a weak point, then it's likely to affect our the impact as well. These also are interdependent in the sense that, uh, for example, if we don't have capacity to do something, it's not likely that those are that whatever that is that we're trying to implement is going to be implemented with fidelity. And it's also like, not likely that we're going to be able to uh, accomplish the scale or the reach of what we want to do. And we could say similarly to each of these components of uh, implementation that uh, they are interdependent and they impact each other, which then consequently they um, impact impact. And in the, uh, <clears throat> the three aspects of implementation really are focused on adults while the impact is for the most part focused on students. And therefore it's critical that each one of them need to be um, monitored to make sure that they are in the, uh, at the right place. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at each of these and what it would take, what it, what they mean, and what it would take to make sure that we're monitoring them. So we're going to start with capacity. And as I said before, um, even though in the platform, fidelity comes first, uh, we start with capacity, as we have learned, because that really significantly affects our ability to implement with fidelity as well as scale and reach. So again, um, on this slide, you note on the right side, um, at the top of that yellow box, the definition of uh, capacity. So those systems, activities, and resources that are necessary to um, adopt and sustain practices, supports, and interventions. And then the key question that as we're doing our monitoring, we ask uh, to make sure that those are in place and it concerns progress on implementing the plan with the sufficient resources that we should have. So how do we do that? How do we monitor capacity? So there are several tools that we can use to do that. Um, you see on the slide right now, you see NERN developed tools that uh, can be helpful for that. So on the left side, you see the district capacity assessment. If any of your districts are involved in implementing MTSS, you probably recognize the district capacity assessment. And in fact, it's frequently become so identified with MTSS that it's considered an MTS tool. 
But the capacity assessment is really about capacity around implementation of any initiative that the district wants to uh, implement. And so what it does is it identifies what capacity even looks like, but then it's a tool that allows us to actually measure um, that capacity. On the right side, you see the driver's best practices assessment. That is a similar tool that is typically used at the school level rather than at the district level. And if you're familiar with, um, with the NERN tools, you might be familiar with the term implementation drivers. And if you're not, don't worry about it. But basically it's what, do the, what are those things that have to be in place for you to implement something well? And what this tool does is it takes a look at what those drivers are that need to be in place, as well as how well are we as a school or a district implementing those. And again, this is primarily a school tool. So um, identifies the data that you'll need to um, collect around that. So these are two tools that can help you take a look at um, identifying what you need to have in place for capacity, as well as monitor whether or not you, you have them in place and to what extent. On the left side here, um, again, you see some of the components, the major components of capacity as um, identified from the hexagon tool. And you can see that this uh, comes from the hexagon discussion uh, analysis document that uh, supports the actual hexagon tool. So um, you know that the hexagon tool comes into play when you're first considering a particular strategy as part of your plan. And so you have the six components that um, are uh, that we need to evaluate to discuss whether or not a plan is viable for us. And just because uh, we rate some elements low doesn't mean that we can't put that uh, particular strategy into place. But what it should mean is that if there are places, uh, components that are low, we might need to incorporate those, say, in activities to bring them up to the place where we can implement with the highest level of quality. And uh, so in terms of um, and then those affect capacity. There is also a very specific component within the hexagon tool that, uh, that references capacity. But as we look at those, that's another tool that we should use to go back to and say, okay, we've decided to implement this. In those areas that uh, we said were strong, are they continuing to be strong? And for those areas that are weaker, did we put a plan in place to address those? And if so, are we starting to make progress to make those stronger? So the hexagon tool, even in and of itself, um, and using this discussion analysis tool that goes along with it, can really help us have that kind of conversation around uh, monitoring. And on the right side, you just see a simple sheet. And again, there's nothing... Uh, right or wrong about this, it's just been a simple sheet that uh, has been developed to help us monitor the, uh, the capacity element. Another tool that really speaks to capacity is the resource allocation review. So those of you who constructed uh, CSI plans, um, as a requirement for getting those plans approved, you were asked to go through this review process to identify whether the resources that uh, are, were necessary to implement a plan with fidelity or integrity um, were being applied with equity. And so initially, you use the tool to determine that. And if that uh, if equity was not part of it, you were asked to, in your plan, identify what you were going to do to ensure that these resources were used. And this especially was true in uh, regards to the reason for your identification. So um, depending on what you found there, if you put components in place in terms of your action plan to address those, then um, it's important to continue to monitor those as well to see whether or not you are increasing equity of uh, in the implementation of your plan. And so on this slide, again, you just see some of the questions 
that are important as part of the consideration of equity of resources. So that RAR is something that uh, you need to do at the beginning, but it's also something that involves questions such as these that you can use to monitor. And in fact, um, um, if you were identified for CSI, then you were required to do it, but it's also a tool that we really recommend for all schools and districts because very few schools and districts have their act all together when it comes time uh, when it comes to this aspect of it. So again, another tool that you can use to help uh, monitor capacity because when you don't have those resources distributed equitably, um, then that does affect your capacity. So just as there are some general questions that uh, we need to ask in terms of monitoring, there are some questions that we need to consider in terms of monitoring of each of these components as well. So the first one here of capacity. And so you see some of the questions that we suggest the district and the school consider in terms of their capacity. So again, um, it has to do with understanding um, of, by the stakeholders. Um, do they understand and have available the resources to make implementation possible? Um, are the requisite supports there um, for students at all, um, both instructionally at uh, tiers one, two, and three, and then for student supports as well? Um, and do the stakeholders understand what those even look and sound like in practice? And if they're not in place, then what do we have to do to put them in place? and have barriers to high quality implementation uh, been reduced as part of our looking at capacity. So some things to consider um, as we get ready to monitor for capacity. We already kind of talked about the hexagon tool being used both as a planning tool as well as um, a monitoring tool. And again, you see the uh, component of capacity built right into the hexagon tool. Although again, the same thing is true for those other components. In this case, um, the hexagon tool really asks us if uh, we're as we're considering something uh, as part of our plan, is it the right thing and can we do it the right way? Um, and you'll notice again that the green components here really are primarily uh, characteristics of the initiative itself, while the uh, blue components really are characteristics of the school or the district or what we sometimes call uh, the uh, implementation site. So with that, uh, we're ready to move on to fidelity. You notice that we've attached the word integrity to it as well. So um, fidelity has to do, as the box states, with the degree to which a strategy or plan is implemented according to research or evidence. Um, what we also encourage districts to consider, and the reason that we've added the word integrity is that, as you'll see with the, the next tool that we're gonna take a look at, we also have to take into account um, not only the research or evidence, but the specific situation in which the, um, the strategy is being uh, implemented. So what are those, what are those local situations, those, those local characteristics that affect our ability to implement the plan with, uh, with fidelity according to research or evidence? And then the key question is, so what progress are we making on implementing the plan as intended? So talking about that then, probably one of the primary tools in helping us to do that is the strategy implementation guide. So um, basically, um, the guide is pretty simple. The concept anyway is pretty simple. The ideal uh, would be for each strategy that's being implemented that you develop one of these guides. And again, the ideal is that the entire staff do that. However, that's not always possible or feasible. And so then we recommend that a small group do it, but before the strategy is actually implemented that all those who are going to be implementing it um, have agreement on what it looks and sounds like in practice, which is the point of this guide. So down the left side, you see what are those critical components that must be in place. Sometimes we call those the non-negotiables. We describe, so what's that gold standard? In fact, if we're doing this as well as what research or evidence says, what should those look like? Uh, we talk about the integrity and that sometimes can be defined in this acceptable variation of implementation. So if we don't have, if we're not able to implement something 
um, with the gold standard all the way through, might there be some things that we could do that are close that would still get us to the end as described by the research or, um, or the evidence um, and still be true to the actual strategy. So I'm thinking, for example, if a school is implementing a literacy strategy at the early level that says you need to implement this for 45 minutes a day, five days a week, but uh, if school schedules don't allow that, then for example, might uh, on a couple of those days, um, if we can't do it 45 minutes, might we, um, on all five days, might we say we're going to do it for an hour on a couple of those days? Um, that's just an example of a consideration that might be an acceptable variation. So this really helps define what implementation of a particular strategy looks like. And then these are some monitoring tools that go along with it. Um, where basically whoever is doing the monitoring, and this can be uh, done by each individual, so this can be done personally, um, this can be done by a team, this could be done by a continuous improvement team or a PLC, it could be done by an admin at the administrative level, who are basically going to take that strategy implementation guide and identify what they're seeing as they're seeing it put in practice. So particular strategy, um, what evidence of implementation are they seeing according to the guide? You know, so what's what's present, what's lacking? Um, you see the other columns really represent the demographics as well as you know potential follow-up based on that. The idea is that this is not to be used for individual um, evaluation, but it's to be used for monitoring uh, strategy implementation. And then that data is brought back to the team and saying, so this is what we saw. Um, what should we do about it? And uh, the document on the right side uh, really is kind of a summary document of all the individual um, performances that are viewed on, uh, on the left side there. So again, important that it not be used for the wrong purpose. But it is a tool, and again, it's a fairly simple tool that can be used for, um, for monitoring, especially in this case for, uh, for fidelity. So just like for capacity, there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves as we're getting ready for monitoring the fidelity or integrity component. So again, do we have that agreement on what implementation looks like? Because if we have a variety of people monitoring it and they're not in agreement, uh, they're not going to be able to produce viable data. Um, again, what tools are we going to use to define implementation? Um, some things that you purchase come with an implementation guide, others um, do not. And it, once that guide has been um, identified, wherever it comes from, um, has the staff been trained on what those are, what those look and sound like? Um, and if not, you know, what needs to be done? Because monitoring when that, uh, this step hasn't been done, really isn't going to get you viable data other than to find out that uh, not everybody understands it in the same way. And then just again, talking about that data and how often and who and, and how and so on. So all of those are things that really need to be defined up front before you actually engage in the monitoring process for fidelity and integrity. And then finally, the third implementation component is scale. So again, um, you notice that uh, by the definition on the left side and then the questions on the right side, scale um, has really two aspects to it. So the first one has to do with uh, reaching the intended populations. And sometimes we call this scale and reach um, because it has to do with reaching the populations. And so on the left side there, you see that can refer to uh, the number of teachers using a strategy, students accessing it, the number of schools and so on. But then uh, a second aspect of this has to do with whether we're implementing the appropriate straight, uh, stage of implementation uh, relative to where we should be. And within that, are we uh, implementing the correct activities that should be associated with that stage? So we reviewed the stages earlier. And so now what we're doing is we're going back and monitoring. So monitoring for scale can really be quite simple. Um, 
It can be as simple as um, just a list of questions such as what are on, on this, um, this slide here. Um, and, and you can read those for yourself. You notice that they have to do with who's receiving the strategy, the level of implementation, um, you know, what is it? Um, the question of equity comes up again in here. Um, and then those, are we doing the right activities for the stage that we're in and so on. A key question at the bottom here is really important for all of the components that we've talked about so far. Um, and that's the question of evidence. So it's easy to say, yes, we're doing the right thing or, or uh, no, we're not. But what's the evidence? What's our proof that we're doing that? And so it's really important for us not to only give a yes or no answer, but to identify the evidence as well. Here's another tool um, that kind of align with the questions on the previous slide that, uh, again, you might use for documentation in terms of uh, collecting that monitoring data. And by the way, all of these tools, these uh, whatever tools you use, can be uploaded into MyKIP as evidence um, for the monitoring component, which we will talk about uh, as far as MyKIP goes in just, uh, in just a little bit. We've already talked a little bit about that equity lens. And on the right side here, you see some uh, questions that uh, really impact equity. And uh, we talk about the difference between equality and equity and justice in terms of removing the barriers. Um, but have we addressed those? Because uh, equity can really impact our ability to um, scale up the initiative at the level that we want, as well as who we're going to be able to reach with uh, with our implementation. So um, again, considering these questions are important in terms of just that uh, monitoring while using that equity lens, which um, is one of the four pieces of the MyKit mindset. Coming back to the implementation stages planning tool again, um, and the reason that this is in here as part of the scale and reach is because it talks about the stages again. And so that's the second component of scale and reach is whether or not we're in the right stage, implementing the right activities. And this tool, um, again, not only can be used for planning, but for monitoring as well. So go back and say, so we said that we are in the installation stage as an example here, but and the installation stage says we should be doing these things. Are we indeed actually doing those? And if not, might we need to move back to an earlier stage? Or if we're doing all these things, might we be ready to move on to um, the next stage? So again, this tool can be uh, can be useful in mul for multiple purposes. So just like for the other components, again, we have these same questions around preparation for monitoring and this time monitoring scale and reach. So again, is there a clarity on who we're intending to reach with a particular strategy and, or what's the schedule for implementation according to the intended way to scale it up? Um, whether we're doing it district-wide, whether we're doing it by individual school, grade level, and so on. And then uh, what's the data that we're going to collect to know whether or not we are um, successfully addressing scale and reach. So you notice in each one of these, that question about data and what's the right data and how we're gonna collect it and who's gonna collect it is really important. And we really need to um, address that right from the get-go before we jump into the actual uh, monitoring itself. And then finally, uh, as we said, all of these, these three aspects of implementation impact each other, but then all of them together determine impact. And if we're not being successful with implementation, it's not likely that we're going to uh, achieve the impact that we want. And so the question around impact in terms of MICIP is really quite simple. Um, and it's that question that you see at the bottom there is, uh, are we making, what progress are we making on our end and uh, interim targets? And certainly um, there are a number of ways to look at even those. Um, and again, we have to determine that as part of our planning process, but in the end, we could make some adjustments if needed. But uh, the end targets are pretty much defined by the value um, that's the ultimate achievement of our goal. And then the interim targets um, are those 
benchmarks along the way that uh, lead to hopefully eventually achieving our end target. And in MICAP, uh, the interim targets can be looked at, can be defined in a couple of different ways. So first of all, um, it can be the value that measures that progress toward an academic or another type of a goal. So for example, if um, we want to be at 80% and we're now at 60%, um, if we have if our plan is for four years, might we want to increase by 5% each year? And by monitoring that, um, might we'll know whether or not we're likely to achieve that end target or not. Similarly, um, especially if you've identified tasks um, in my KIP, uh, the interim target could be uh, progress toward implementation of a particular goal. And the example that I gave here was about professional learning. So if we're uh, in installation and we say we need to uh, offer professional learning on a new, uh, a new strategy, then have we done that or not? And oftentimes this uh, missed activities or non-implemented activities, such as what this might be or tasks, um, are reasons that uh, we feel like we might need to adjust um, and we're not reaching our, um, our interim target measures. And of course, again, there are, there are a lot of data sources. What we've done here is just provided some data sources that uh, can be used for each of the three categories um, that you start with for your data story in ICIP. Um, and one, again, one of the considerations is as you're choosing what data to include initially in your data story, you want to think about later on that same data being used for monitoring purposes. And is it is it appropriate to use it for monitoring purposes? And if not, might there be other data that is a better determiner of your data story? So again, you see uh, a number of uh, data sources here, both in the academic, the non-academic, as well as systems. And while it's not required to have data from every one of those areas, we really do encourage uh, districts as part of writing their data story, and then later on in monitoring to actually consider data in all of those areas. So that's one way to organize data. Another way certainly is by the four kinds of data, um, so uh, or the four types of data. And here you see some examples of questions that get answered by the four types of, uh, of data. And so is your data story representative of these four types of data as well? Again, do you have to have all of them? No, but uh, at least you should consider whether or not um, types that you might not have will enrich your, uh, your, your data story. We've already talked about the street data and the importance of having that perception data from those who are being implemented, uh, impacted rather by your plan as part of the plan. And so I won't belabor that, but again, um, it's really important to include that in, uh, in your plan. So just like, oh, and, and another, um, Another aspect that you might want to consider in terms of, um, of display of monitoring data is this charting practice. So you see uh, the starting point here in this particular um, example. Um, you'll see where they're noting some changes um, and you, you can see where they're trying to go and how they're either reaching or not reaching that. And sometimes having things um, described in words is not nearly as impactful as having uh, having them described visually. So as you're gathering uh, monitoring data, you might wanna consider whether or not there might be a visual way to display that for your stakeholders to really understand the kinds of progress that you're making. So just like again for the others, um, in terms of preparation for monitoring impact, um, some key questions. So do we know even know what um, impact is gonna look like or success will look like? And then of course the how, the by whom and on what schedule. And do we know and have common understanding of uh, both the end and interim targets? Okay. So before we jump into monitoring impact, those are some um, important questions that we really need to answer. So once we've been doing our monitoring, then of course the questions um, come up. So um, do we need to consider making some adjustments? So 
um, there's a tipping point for making adjustments. So like I said earlier, we don't want to jump into it too soon uh, before we really give it a chance to take hold. At the same time, we don't wanna waste time and wait too long for uh, making adjustments if they're needed um, because we're wasting valuable kid time as well as teacher time and so on. So right in the MyKIP uh, adjust segment, you'll see that if you choose to uh, consider making some adjustments, you have these questions that pop up and you can see that you can uh, make adjustments in your data store, your goal, your strategies and activities. But a general question really needs to be similar to the other questions that we were asking earlier about preparation is, do we actually have the right monitoring tools to give us the information that we need to really consider uh, adjusting? And that's an important tool that needs to be asked, not just about adjusting, but across the board is, are we really using the tools that will give us the data that we need to do this uh, with integrity? And I'm not going to read them all, but you see here some questions again that pop up right in the MyKit platform that before you jump right into making adjustments, have you considered these other things? Have you done these other things? And it's really important um, to use questions such as these to help you have that conversation about is now the right time. So we talked earlier about the importance of not only reflecting on uh, implementation of the plan itself, the strategies within the plan, but also about the entire continuous improvement process. So periodically, once, once a year um, might be sufficient, um, or you might wanna do it a couple times a year to say, so how are how is our implementation process, our entire continuous improvement process going? And really the categories are the same. Um, as you take a look at what those questions are, though, you might find that they're just maybe a little bit more broadly applied. So rather than being applied to a very specific strategy, um, they might be applied to something uh, more broadly. And then certainly the summary questions, again, are summarizing the data around not just a strategy, but around the entire process. So it doesn't have to be done every month or, or um, even every uh, semester necessarily. But we would suggest that at least once a year that a district kind of step back and say, so how is our entire process going? And again, being used to these categories for a strategy should uh, make it fairly easy to have the conversation in terms of the whole process. But just like with strategies, it's important to not only ask the question, but to say, um, what's our evidence to uh, allow us to make uh, to, to answer the particular questions that are on uh, on the slides here. And a lot of the data that you gather as part of your monitoring of those co other components can be used here to really answer the question about, so how is our process going overall? So in the MyKit platform itself, uh, some of you may have already been working in it. For some of you, this might be brand new. So to do monitoring, the mechanics of monitoring in the platform itself, um, you'll see that you enter that through the ribbon at the top um, of your page, and it goes through the implement rib component of the ribbon, where the first thing you'll come to, it says review my kit portfolio. So what you'll do there is then uh, when you click on that, you'll get all your goals and underneath that, your strategies. So here you can see that uh, the sample goal, and this comes out of our sample, our training plan. Um, we have one goal in there, it's of improving student achievement. And you see underneath that, we have monitor and evaluate buttons. And so to complete the monitor, or to engage, I should say, in the monitoring process, you simply click on monitor. And then what it does is uh, it pulls for that goal, it pulls up your uh, strategies and activities. And so in this case, the connected mathematics project is the strategy and you see a number of activities underneath that. Um, and then you also see um, a button called the monitoring tool. So you click on that next and it takes you then to a screen that looks like this. And you should recognize the categories that are on this screen. Um, the three implementation categories, as well as the impact category. And you can see at each one of those, you have the button that says create note. 
So I've been talking about not only is it important for us to put down what we think is happening, but for us for uh, us to indicate what the evidence is, what the data is as well. So for in each of these cases, not only can you create the note that gives your opinions, but you can also pull in the actual evidence. And so if you've actually added, uh, if you started with uh, your data story from these sources, then you can go back and pull in the same data element, as I said, when you were writing some considerations when you're uh, forming your data story, pull in the comparable report um, from the same location, write in as long as it's in one of the uh, one of these sources, the same sources. And of course, then you can upload district data from other, source, uh, other sources as well. But uh, that's a nice feature to have. And the other thing is that when you're creating notes, the latest note will automatically stack on the previous note. So you'll have kind of a running record of uh, all the notes around, uh, around monitoring. And then um, when you uh, have completed uh, or gotten to a certain stage with your, with your monitoring, then you'll have the opportunity to uh, adjust. And here you see what I was talking about in terms of the consideration questions that pop up. So not only do you have to, uh, are you asked to consider these questions, but you are also then asked before you can actually click on one of these areas for adjustment. And um, by clicking on that area, it'll take you back to that part of the platform, but you're asked to write a rationale for why you believe that you should be adjusting. At the bottom of this, you see a video from a presentation that Terry and I did some time back already around um, uh, my kit for districts and schools identified for supports that actually walks you through this and shows you um, what this looks like, even though I've provided some screenshots that actually walks you through the process of, uh, of doing this in the actual platform. So you might want to check that out, especially if this is new to you. So the last four slides here really get at, so what is mon what does monitoring look and sound like for schools and districts that have been identified for um, CSI? And the first two slides talk about those that are not in a partnership district. So we've already kind of reviewed um, the kinds of conversation, and this is kind of the summary conversation that you would have after looking at um, the monitoring notes um, from those other categories. And so this is really kind of the summary conversation that you'll have in each of those four categories, as well as summary overall about the implementation of your plan. Again, so these are for those schools not in a partnership district. Um, there are, um, there are several supports that you have in place. Obviously, the first support is you're going to get from the district itself. And what we've tried to do is to identify the role of each of these entities. So again, the role of the district is to make sure that the plans are being implemented in monitoring, as well as to provide whatever system level supports are necessary to be able uh, for a school to do that. They also, uh, for the most part, have ISD or ESA partners um, that can help with this process. So um, we've suggested to ISDs or ESAs that uh, if a school would like, or if a district would like to have an outside facilitator, that maybe that's a role that the ISD or the ESA could play is uh, facilitating the monitoring conversation, as well as uh, helping a school put their actual notes into the, uh, into the platform. And then um, MDE has created uh, this role called Coordinated Supports Point of Contact. And really the role of that individual is to do two things. Number one, really just to simply be a critical friend during the implement and monitor conversations, um, as well as maybe to make some connections to MDE. So for example, as part of that conversation, if it, uh, comes up that there might be an MDE resource that could support um, the implementation of a plan, the CSPC could help connect the district or the school to that resource. Um, the other role is uh, that MD has been asked 
to to have. And in fact, we uh, were uh, noted for not having done this the last round is uh, we are responsible on behalf of the federal uh, Department of Education for making sure that districts identified and schools identified for CSI have plans and that they are also that they are engaging in the monitoring process. And so what we have asked our CSPCs to do is to just simply for uh, for the four meetings that we suggest that they have um, for monitoring, that they just take down some information and the information they're asked to collect is just that information that's there. So really the first part is just kind of the demographics. And then, so what's the summary of what uh, a district found out at these uh, monitoring meetings? You know, what's working, what's, what's uh, the evidence? And again, you can see the categories there. And then maybe what barriers um, are schools encountering? what uh, areas of refinement might they need and what might they be doing to address those? And especially, can the department help in any way? We have also prepared this coaching guide. And on the bottom here, you see a link to the coaching guide. Now this is developed specifically for schools identified for CSI, not in a partnership district. However, um, the 95% of what's in this guide would apply to um, schools in partnership districts, as well as to schools not in any kind of identification. What it really does is it covers just about everything that we've covered up to this slide in our previous conversation. So um, you might find that helpful. What I would suggest that you do is you, right now that guide is in a Google um, folder. What I would suggest that you do is along with the uh, two things that we have put in the chat, that you download those and put them in your own file, name them the way that you want to name them and put them in your own file so that in case the Google folder goes away, um, you don't lose those. And then just quickly um, for those schools that are in a partnership district. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see that they are also going to be engaged in monitoring conversations. The frequency of that uh, will depend on um, their level. So you can see uh, the intensive, the essential, and the fundamental level districts. And up at the top there, you see the kinds of things that they're going to be talking about in these meetings. Okay? Um, similar kinds of things to what we've been talking about so far. And that last bullet there really specifically identifies, so what's happening around those things. So again, there's the consistency. And then um, the uh, the, the other component is that there's going to be an 18 month benchmark review um, next year um, where they'll be talking about, so what kinds of progress are they making on their uh, interim target benchmarks, um, as well as a summary of these four areas that we've been talking about. So what we've tried to do is to really be consistent with what all schools and districts are doing in the state. Um, and uh, really focusing on those that make the biggest Im impact on implementation and impact. And so um, we uh, don't think that uh, schools identified for CSI should be doing anything different. It just might be exactly what it's about, but really it's the same thing. It's what research has said is good, high quality implementation, monitoring, and overall continuous improvement. So that was a quick trip through um, what uh, we mean by implementation and monitoring. And that's really what we should be doing uh, right now with all of our districts across the state, but especially those uh, schools that have been identified for, uh, for CSI. And so what we're, we've recommended, especially when we talk about these four, um, these four meetings, these four summary meetings, is that right now you should just be really collecting the are, are talking about where are you in terms of implementation and do you have the things in place you need for high quality? And if not, what might you put in place to ensure high quality implementation? Have similar conversations about your readiness for monitoring and then uh, engage in the practices of, of monitoring. And then maybe around the end of the year, you'll be ready to have that conversation as we look into our third year, are there some things that we should be adjusting or not adjusting? Um, nothing says you have to, nothing says that you should or you shouldn't. 
except for the data. And so that's why it's so important that uh, that we collect that data. 